Good afternoon, everyone. There are no announcements except for this Wednesday, there will be 840 worship, but that will be on Zoom, so you can look for that link in Today on the Hill. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for this morning's prelude. Blessed be the one, holy and living God. Today's hymn is Lift Every Voice and Sing.
Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, in your goodness keep us, we pray, from all things that may hurt us, that we, being ready both in mind and body, may accomplish with free hearts those things with which belong to your purpose. Amen. I ask your prayers for all who live and work in the borough of Pottstown. I ask your prayers for all who govern and hold positions of authority, especially the mayor and borough council, the governor and the president. We pray for both US presidential candidates and our deeply divided nation in the month leading up to the election. I ask your prayers for all whose lives have been touched by tragedy, whether by accident or by deliberate act. I ask your prayers for the sick, we pray for all suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic and for all risking their lives to care for others. I ask your thanksgivings for those celebrating birthdays in this part of the week. Phil, Annabelle, Alina, Chelsea, Alex, Jerry, Avery, Miss Hunter, Mrs. Norman, and Miss Crow. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, Mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. For your namesake, amen. Our speaker this morning is Miss McConney. After spending a good portion of her childhood on the hill with her older brother Michael, class of 2007, Miss McConney became a full-time faculty member last year. She will be entering her fourth season as a coach with the girls lacrosse team and her fifth with the girls ice hockey team. She teaches history, serves as student life coordinator, and is a dorm parent in Dell Village. Ms. McConney. It's just after 8 a.m. I'm surrounded by the gray walls of mundanity, otherwise known as a cubicle. I'm blessed to have the one that happens to be right next to Congregation Corner, as I've affectionately dubbed it in my own head, the place where everyone seems to gather and scream at each other with bursting forehead veins, just the place to put the only 20-something female in the office, the calmest of environments, totally zen. Naturally, I have my headphones on. My head bounces to the beat of something likely just as angry as Gary seems to be, giving the flailing of his arms and the red hue of his face. And my phone rings. The caller ID reads, Dad. I tilt my head just to the left. Another moment. My stomach drops. For as odd as it is for my father to be calling me, 
After years of my calling him on a daily basis, I also know why, I also know exactly why he's calling. A murmured conversation, a poke of my head into my boss's office, a foggy walk to the car, a breath in, then a breath out. I start the engine, head toward the hospice. 10 hours later, I'm in Hall Eccleston Arena, shooting pucks at kids, running drills, doing the normal hockey coach stuff. And there's no place I'd rather be. It's a few minutes into the first period of the game. A puck lands in the corner of the defensive zone. I pivot and give chase. I gather the puck and feel pressure on my shoulder. I quickly change direction to lose the opposing player, and it seems to do the trick based upon the glance out of the corner of my eye, which shows open ice, just like I planned. And then, I'm violently thrown against the glass face first. So much for losing the opposing player. The whistle blows immediately. I turn and spot the ref and tilt my head slightly to the left. He signals a major penalty for a check from behind. Nice, a power play. I skate back to the bench for a line change. My glove starts to slide off. Strange. I squeeze my hand, trying to keep it on, but it just slips right off. I look down and see my wrist swollen to at least twice its normal size. Something is clearly very wrong here. My eyes dart from the bench to the stands. They're wide open, frantic. I then spot her, with my five-year-old sister close behind, running to the bench. I speed up and meet her. Eight hours later, my arm is cast in plaster, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat with half of my equipment still on. Soft rock seeps through the radio. I let my head fall back onto the car seat and start a normal conversation. Nothing out of the ordinary happened today. It's just another Saturday, and there's no other way I would want it. It's just after four o'clock. I step to the garage door and sprint inside to greet my dad. He's still on the couch, stiller than even his normal laid-back attitude would mandate. His eyes are glued to the TV. I follow his gaze. The news is on, another abnormal occurrence. My eyes skim over the headline, attacks against New York and Washington. I think I know where those places are. My fourth grader brain sort of gets it. Smoke billows off the buildings in the main shot, and a deeper understanding, yet still an incomplete one, sets in. I ask my dad a fourth grader amount of questions, which he calmly answers while bouncing my two-year-old sister on his leg. My older brother runs downstairs to provide further clarification for me since he got to watch t TV while school was going on. I wasn't even allowed outside for recess. Suddenly, something weightier falls onto my shoulders. At least as, I, as complete an understanding as a fourth grader can have, one that exists without a clear conception of why. Three hours later, my mom bursts through the same garage door She's in tears. I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to be there. I didn't know my mom could cry. I hug her. Often at this school, we talk about balance, about following passions, about forming meaningful relationships. I certainly have and will continue to speak about these things at great length. But we don't always stress why we stress these things. And I'm guilty of that, too. Sometimes, you know, it goes back to the old, I have more life experience than you, so you should listen to me, type of thing. It's not always the best justification for a lesson on balance, on passion, on relationships. But just so you know, these lessons, regardless of their justification, and even while they may be annoying, are important, are genuine, and are true. The thing is, we value these virtues of balance, of passion, of relationships, ultimately because they help us to overcome the most challenging moments of our lives and to squeeze the most life out of life that we can. That's the why. Life does pass quickly, though. It's hard to wrap your arms around. And the longer that you live, the faster that it goes by. We often don't realize that we're in the midst of the good times until they're long gone. Everyone tries desperately to stay in the moment, to live mindfully, to be present. But you can't at least not all the time, because as soon as, you as soon as you start to try to hold on to what is, it becomes what was. You begin living in the past, 
and in the moments that are happening right now are missed. And you can't miss what's right in front of you because before you know it, it'll be gone. So you start paying attention to what's going on right now to focus on what is rather than what was, and it's a real catch-22. But life's full of those, too. It's rare that you get to enjoy the calm of sitting in a car after a hospital trip, that you get to go back to normalcy without much of a conversation, that your inability to truly understand is accepted. You can't let the catch-22 stop you from engaging or from connecting. Because even if you lose the ones you love the most, and you undoubtedly will, just as I have, the warmth that you feel when you're with those people, for however long you're with them, when you're in the moment, well, that lasts forever. That warmth never leaves you, even after the person that made you feel warm passes on to the next life. You learn how to move forward. The good thing is that this place also has a way of making us feel that kind of warmth. And yeah, even when I'm yelling at the hockey girls to stop talking on the bus, I do feel it too, despite what I will or will not admit after giving this chapel talk. I feel it when I walk into the academic center in the morning, when I walk into the dining hall, when I speak with all of you. It may not feel the same as it did when I was 12 in the car with my mom. There's no way it could feel the same and only partially because I will never get that exact same feeling again. It's gone from me forever. It's in the past. I can't get it back. But I remember the feeling, and I feel it when I'm here, at least in some way, shape, or form. To be honest, I can't quite put my finger on what makes this place so full of warmth. It's another catch-22. Although, I can perhaps narrow it down to a few things saying hello to those who walk by you, others genuinely asking you how you're doing, people going out of their way to check in on one another, spending hours in dorms, in classrooms, on buses without any protest, figuring out solutions that make our current situation truly work, sacrificing time and energy to support one another, patiently answering questions to promote understanding, finding way to, ways to give hugs even when we can't physically hug, supporting one another when emotions raised by a single phone call shatter us. Okay, maybe that's more than just a few things, but this may not surprise us if we've realized that we too feel this warmth in our own way when we're here. We understand how powerful it can be when we give someone a hug, even when they're not someone who cries, how this can be a two-way comfort and how hard it is to live in the moment. We understand how someone running from the stands can represent a perfectly timed intervention, how it's just what we need when we need it, and how this translates into warmth. We understand that all of this can happen here, just as long as we're paying attention to the present, just as long as we're willing to accept some lessons for their content alone, not for their why just as long as we know we will be able to go to our own Hall Eccleston arenas after a phone call changes the course of the rest of our lives. Because even though catch-22s run rampant through this place and through life, doesn't mean we can't overcome challenge, that we can't feel the warmth, that we can't squeeze the juice out of life by pursuing life in the present. We can. And if you haven't realized this yet, then I encourage you to ask a fourth greater amount of questions. The present, life, warmth, are each difficult for us to wrap our arms around in a hug, perhaps even more so right now. But this chapel talk isn't about COVID-19. It's about valuing the warmth that exists here, now, at the hill, in your lives, everywhere. Because life passes by quite quickly and it will keep ticking by whether or not you value the warmth, the love in your life. Because life itself doesn't care whether or not you squeeze the juice out of it. It's up to you to make the most out of the little time that you have here. It's up to you to intentionally do the little things. It's up to you to intervene at the exact right moment. I, for one, choose to be here every day. And whether or not you realize it, you do too. You could be anywhere else in the world right now. Even if you're not physically here, you're here listening to me talk. And the choice that you're making in this moment is how you make the most out of your life. 
In fact, each choice that you will ever make, each of which occur in the present, represent the totality of your life. I chose to give a chapel talk. I chose to share stories about my mother. I chose to talk about warmth. So, choose to embrace the warmth that is here. Choose to value balance, to follow your passions, to commit to relationships. You can't make life slow down, but by intentionally making a choice in how you spend your time, by surrounding yourselves with warmth, with love, you can, just maybe, spend a little bit more time in the present. It's right around five o'clock. I'm lying back against the comfortable, yet not comfortable, plush of the bus seat. A pillow rests beneath my head. Buses are nothing new after finishing four years of college hockey. Butterflies still float through my stomach, low in intensity, but nevertheless there. I close my eyes and take a deep breath, trying to gain control. I glance out the window and see familiar landmarks. We're getting closer to Simsbury, Connecticut. Something equally as angry as Gary seemed to be this morning seeps into my ears through my headphones. The coach sitting in front of me, someone I've only really known for a few weeks now, spins around. I notice him say a few words but can't hear. I pull off one of my headphones. Sorry, what'd you say? Did your, did your mom die? Yeah, she did. You know you don't have to be here. I know. I want to be here. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. <laughs>